So as we, as we grow older, we find that we, used, we do things that we didn't do before. Maybe you grew up thinking that um, watching a violent movie is really bad. And when you're little, you kind of frowned upon and you pointed your finger at people who kids, other kids who used to watch those movies. Maybe you grew up thinking that, um, I don't know, like saying a bad word is really, really bad. But as you grow older, what you find is that you actually do the things that you used to think were bad. And not only that, you do a lot of them. And uh, you grow, you have grown custom, not only you do them, but you're accustomed to it, and you don't think much of it, and you do a lot of it. So as we grow older, we, I, I ask myself when I look at my life, am I growing more childlike as I journey with God? As I older I get, do I become more childlike or am I becoming more of an adult who is in charge of my life? And I know what is good. I know what, is cap what I'm capable and what is not. And, you know, I, I just want to be in charge of my own destiny. When I say childlike, though, I don't mean for you to be more childish in a sense of Peter Pan syndrome where you can't commit, you don't like responsibilities, and you just like to party and play. But really, I'm talking about being childlike in God, where you are depending on God, that you want to have relationship with God the Father. And, and you like Him, and you look to Him, and you want to fellowship with Him, and you want to hold Him. And you're really concerned about how He thinks about your life. And you're really concerned about uh, if the things that you're doing is pleasing to him or not. And you're coming to him with per for permissions and you're coming to him for approval. And, and you're coming to him to understand what is truly spiritually healthy and detriment or detrimental. It doesn't, um, it, it doesn't take a lot for us to grow slowly, uh, for us to slowly drift apart from God. It just takes something very literal in the beginning and for us to be far away from God as we grow older. It's kind of like shooting a target. And here from this, from the barrel's point of view, you're only one degree off. But as that bullet travels over space and time, that one degree of deviance gets larger and larger and larger and further it, uh, is away from the target um, as it travels. And, and that's, that's the predicament. That's the, that's the uh, circumstance that you and I are in today. As we travel through life, as we go farther and farther away, and as we live our life longer and longer, are we slowly, little by little, deviating from God and getting farther away from Him? Or are we actually on target? We are still on the narrow and straight path and that we are not deviating from that path. It's kind of like a, a jar of plum that we had in our house. In our house, we have two plum trees, and they're just mini little plums. They're not those big, large, regular ones. And about at the towards uh, end of the summer, they all fall to the ground. And occasionally, not every year, but every once in a while, we would collect them, the ones that had fallen, and we wash them. And um, the last one actually was made by my mother-in-law, and she would uh, sanitize, sterilize a bottle, uh, a jar, and she would put all these plums and pour sugar on it, and we would cut it and seal it tight, with um, and seal the seal the opening with saran wrap so that nothing gets in. And it's kind of fun to watch how things ferment, so that it becomes a syrup at the end. And I'm watching it, and it takes several months, and you're looking at it, and the plum is getting softer, and the juice is being released. And once you have that syrup, you can put it in your cooking, like in your meal, um, or I like it in my coffee or my tea. And so it's like a sense of anticipation of um, getting a finished product. 
But I noticed that it was changing color a little bit darker than um, what I'm used to seeing. I let it go thinking that it must be okay, I'm not an expert. But in the end, what we had was a um, breach of sealing, I guess, or there was a pore, a spore inside. And we, the whole jar turned, um, was spoiled, was filled with fungus. And when we opened the lid, there was this white, fluffy, white fungus and black fungus. And we had to throw the whole thing out after months and after months of waiting for it to turn into a syrup. I, our life, Solomon's life is kind of like that, and it's always our life. It starts off nice and fresh, and it's good. And we have a lot of anticipation and hope for this thing to turn out well. But it just takes one little contamination for it to turn into something that is totally, un 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 totally unconsumable. We live, we begin our life, I, I mean, if you set a kid down and, and you, you tell them, um, you ask them, when you grow older, like in your 30s and 40s, how would you like to um, get divorced, become a workaholic, be estranged from your children, and just have all these joys sucked out of your life? And, and that, would you, how would you like to aim for that? I don't think any one of us would say, that seems like a good way to go. That's what I'm looking forward to when I'm 40. I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to build my life towards that kind of life. None of us do that. But sometimes we get there. We're working excessively. That our relationship becomes sour and sour more and more every single day. And nobody plans for it. Nobody aims for it. Nobody aims to forget their faith in God. Nobody aims for any one of these things. But we get into it just by having a little bit of something that gets deviated further and further as we live our life. King Solomon was that kind of guy. When he started his kingship, he asked God, I need wisdom. I need wisdom to keep this country the way it is. That you have given me a task, and without you, without your help, I cannot do this. So God blesses him with incredible amount of wisdom. And with that, he was able to rule his land in the way that, God ple in the way that pleased God. But just before he asked for wisdom, he noticed that there's spores that entered into his life. Just before God asked him, what is it that you want, Solomon? And he asked for wisdom. He committed something else. He committed himself to Egyptian Pharaoh. He made an alliance with him and to seal that alliance so that there's peace between that superpower and with his country is to marry an Egyptian princess. Just one marriage. He wanted to keep the peace in the land that God has given to him, that his father David has fought as a warrior to achieve. So in order to do that, he made one single compromise, that he wanted to maintain peace in the vast array of all these surrounding nations around them. So he made one choice to marry an Egyptian princess. King Solomon, reigned for 40 years. Within those 40 years, he had 1,000 marriages, 700 princesses that were his wives, and 300 concubines. So 1,000 women, 1,000 wives in his life. That one compromise that he made over the span of 40 years, it grew into 1,000. And through those marriages, he achieved peace. He has achieved something and has maintained the peace that his father has brought about. It was initially a good idea. He has done it with good heart. He wanted to give people peace that his father gave them through being totally dedicated to God. He wanted to preserve that blessing 
So this one marriage was a choice that he made. But eventually, he married everyone around him. He married every nation. By that, he married every nation that was bordering his country. Any country that may have posed threat, he married one from each one of them. As he did that, something changed in his heart. Instead of just marrying one from each country, his heart turned to, it's not the peace is what I'm after. What I'm after is that I want love. I want pleasure. And in the scripture, it says that he loved his wives. It wasn't what it was started out as something good became corrupted. And that corruption utterly corrupted him. Thousand wives, brothers and sisters. He reigned for 40 years, and you do the math. The most weddings that I've done in one summer was 11. 11 in one summer. But King Solomon had at least 25 weddings a year. That's every other weekend. Every other weekend, he would take time off from being a king, and he would walk down the aisle to a new wife. Because the one that he married two weeks ago is no longer fresh, no longer interesting. He wanted something new. He wanted that feeling of honeymoon, meeting someone for the first time and falling in love with her for the very first time, but just for two weeks. And he would grow tired of that, and he would look for someone else, and he would marry her. Every other week, he was getting married. Imagine all the other wives that preceded, that his love and his commitment, his vows only lasted two weeks, and that was his life. And those wives came, and he, uh, they, brought their, uh, they brought their God, and that corrupted King Solomon. God warned him twice, but he would not heed, because his passion and his love for these women have grown so large that his wisdom, the, the wisdom that God has given him, dwarfed in comparison to his sinful, lustful heart. It says in the scripture that Jesus said, your eye is lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. And here's the thing. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. Solomon had light in the beginning. He had looked at his nation and said, how am I going to rule these people without God's wisdom? But then later on, he looked at all these other nations and he made peace treaty with them. And those same eyes that were focused on God later just focused on women. And the light that was once in him became darkness. And that was his life. The light in him was the darkness. And he lived his life like that. So we, we ask ourselves, how do we know that our own desires are still godly and healthy? How do we know? How do we know that the decisions that we make today, the one single decision to get a job, one single decision to marry someone and to have children and enroll them in programs and, and go to work and come back home from work or go to school and, and study to become, a, become whatever you want and you are doing all of these things for the glory of God and God has entered into your equation. But how do you know that there is no corruption within you, that your desire is healthy and that as you fulfill your desires, at the end of your life, it is bringing you closer and closer and closer to God. Some of us start like this, and we come closer and closer to God. Some of us start right on the narrow path, and we become farther and farther away from God as we grow older. That's the decision that you made in your life. Bring you humility, where you say to yourself, God, Thank you for giving me this job. 
Thank you for helping me to get into this school. Thank you for giving me life. And I know that I can't do this by myself, that I cannot keep myself pure and righteous and godly. Because in this text, what we're seeing is that the wisest person, even the greatest wisdom, is no guarantee to maintaining our relationship with God. So that should give us some sort of sobering thought and realization that you cannot keep faith by yourself. It is not from your own heart, it's not from your own mind, or neither is it combined together that you can't do this by yourself. That's the decisions that you make, are, or are you now at your age, at your age, do you depend on God more and more? Do you desire to serve people more and more? That you look at people and say, I need to serve that person. I need to give preferential treatment to that person. Or do you see that people are just dumber and dumber and you becoming more grumpier as you grow older? Where is your desire taking you today? I want you to look at the fruit of your desires. As the seed germinates and grows into a stem, stem into a tree, and the green stem darkens into a brown bark, and the branches are expanding against the horizon, what fruit will you have at the tip of those branches? At the end of summer of your life, as you near your life, as in, in the stage of, of your green, lush living, what is at the end of every branches of your life? Do you identify childlikeness? Or do you identify excessiveness in the things that you have desired? And the things that you have wanted to achieve and to possess. Are we like Solomon, where one wife is not enough? Where one treaty is not enough? Are we like Solomon, desiring for something in the name of God, in the name of serving other people, but we have come to a point where everything is excessive? Are we just excessive today and we don't even know it? And we've fallen in love with it so much so that we can't even identify the excessive things that we have. And those excessive things are turning away from God and we can't stop ourselves. In our culture, we love excessive everything, unsustainable everything. Bigger is better. More is more is the mantra today. I'm not against birthday parties, weddings, shoes, and whatever else that we buy and we do to celebrate. But don't you think that we have become excessive in the way that we celebrate with one another, the way that we give ourselves to marriages, the way that we celebrate our engagement, our honeymoon, the way that we renovate our house, the cars that we buy, bigger motor, bigger space in the car. And let me tell you, I, I drive a Corolla, but if I had the money, I would probably buy an electric truck, electric full-size pickup truck. And my kids make fun of me. And one time I was looking at, on YouTube and there was like a $2 million RV that goes anywhere in the world, desert, Siberia, you name it, mountain, it can go everywhere. And I was just telling my family, isn't it cool that you can have these cool adventures? And Mian said, Sean, I think if you had the money, you would probably buy that. And I said, no, are you kidding me? But then, then I realized, yeah, I probably would. If I had millions and millions of dollars, I probably would. Because our culture celebrates excessiveness. That we can take granite countertop in an RV and we take it all over the world so that we can cook something in the lap of luxury. We're all guilty. When I walk into my house, I see so many shoes that it's like a jungle. I, I have to literally like plow my way through my, the front of my house to get to the other side. And I count how many shoes that I have 
two runners, one dress shoes for a rainy day, one dress shoes for every day, one dress shoes for church. And, and then next thing you know, you have sliders, you have your whatever else, and it just is filling your life. And it's excessive. And we don't know what to do with them because we don't want to give them up. And I want you to know, in your excessive, in, in the way that you and I celebrate excessiveness, that there's spirituality and consequences attached to our excessiveness. You can't just have too many things and say, I still love God. It would be nice if we can. Even shoes come with their own spirituality. If you are thinking about shoes, 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 that, even that, has a way of corrupting your soul. Because you probably want those shoes because you want to look good. And you probably want to look good because you have low self-esteem. Or there's a hole inside of you that you're, you're trying to mend and plug and fill. So one, shoes doesn't, one, sho one pair of shoes don't do it. So you've you got to get more and more and more. And you think those pleasures will add up on top of each other, but it doesn't. We all have something that we do that is excessive. And they all come with consequences. And they all come with their own spirituality that is not godly and that does not point to God. Some of us work excessively. And we began to do that because we want to provide for our family or we want to prepare ourselves for a wedding. And we just work, work, work. And we just want to do well and be accepted in the company, but just become so excessive. And that excessiveness is obvious. It comes with its own spirituality of you being the sole provider, you being the shepherd, and you are the king, and you are the manna giver. And pretty soon you realize more you work and longer and you work like that, and, and as years go by, you're further and further away from God. Look at the fruit of your life. What are you bearing out of your own desires of your heart? Are you becoming childlike? Are you getting closer to God? Or is your excessiveness turning you farther and farther away from God? If there are kids here today, I just have one more uh, illustration. And, and, and this is not just kids, because we, I grew up playing games, but luckily I didn't get into it. But we have, what, PC, we have phones, we have, um, Nintendo and, and, and Game Boy, whatever else. Actually, Game Boy is long gone now. But Nintendo Switch and, and PS5 and, and Xbox, and we have no shortage of games and Netflix and Disney Plus or Hulu if you're from the States. And all of these media is really turning us away from God. Um, I, I, I have so many facts and figures I want to run through, but I, I want to get to the other points. But kids, look, Excessive gaming and excessive entertaining yourself through this media does not bring you closer to God because you're learning the culture and spirituality that game has. Every game has its own spirituality and own moral lessons in it. And you're just getting caught into that. And they make it so addictive for you that you have to purchase something and you have to think about it all the time. And again, I'm guilty of, of that as well. And we all must be vigilant because we all fail and we all struggle with these things. Here's what, I, there are two things I would like to suggest, two big broad categories. One, there's some things that you cannot do, okay? And there's some things that you should start doing. So what you can't do, let's start with that. Here's what I recommend that you do not do. One. I don't want you to trust in your past success as Christians. And what, what, am I, what, what I mean by that is you feel like, oh, I haven't watched this, I haven't done this, I haven't bought something, I haven't got mad at my whatever, and, and um, I, I, I'm not overworking these days, and, and you feel good and you feel close to God. Whatever success that you had in the past and you're enjoying right now, do not celebrate them in a way that you think, I am free of my addiction. I am free from my excessiveness because the seed is there. 
the spore is in the jar. It just hadn't had chance to grow. But once the sunlight dims and the darkness is prolonged, it will get there, it will grow, and it will bear its fruit. Do not celebrate your past success. And do not trust yourself. Solomon wrote probably two to three books in the Bible. If you're conservative, conservative, he wrote three books. A lot of the Proverbs that we read in the Bible is written by him. He had wisdom beyond wisdom, but he failed. You and I don't have a chance. You and I don't stand a chance. If you think, I'm not going to be like that, I'm not going to be excessive in the way that I enroll my kids in programs, I'm not going to be excessive in the way that I, what I expect from my children, I'm not going to be excessive in the way that what I expect out of myself as a man or woman, you think you are somehow free from all these temptations and deviations, you're already sinning. Don't trust yourself. Do not trust in yourself in any way, shape, or form. So then what do we do? Here's the th here are a few things that we should do, okay? I want us to practice a couple of spiritual disciplines, particularly in the area of excessiveness. And, um, you know, sometimes I, you know, <laughs> I, I try to plan and I try to think and, and try to make things line up. And I, I do that as best as I can. But in this case, it's all providence. I, I, I didn't plan for this to happen. It just, it just did. And um, what I mean by that is today, we're talking about excessiveness of King Solomon. And on the past week, we have gone through fasting, spiritual discipline of fasting. And this coming week, we're going to practice the spiritual discipline of simplicity and frugality. And these three spiritual disciplines is something that I really want you to look at and practice. Because there's so much excessiveness in our life that it numbs us towards the childlikeness. It numbs us towards the, the joy of getting God's blessings. It numbs us from the fact that we're feeling so anxious and we don't know what to do about it. But it, it just, there's so many things if you feel nervous, watch a movie. If you feel nervous or stressed about your future, buy something. If you are uncertain about what will happen, then work more and make more money. Or if you are feeling like you have failed in, in the way that uh, you parent as a man or woman, then vicariously live it out through your children. And we have this excessiveness everywhere. And we don't know that we're excessive. We don't know that we have these feelings until you practice these spiritual disciplines. Spiritual discipline in itself, if you listen to the introduction to spiritual discipline, the spiritual discipline in and of itself does not hold any power to make you humble or to transform your life or to give grace and mercy and forgiveness. It simply is an adapter as, as I hold in my hand. It goes from your laptop and it goes to the source of power. It just simply connects the person to God. So spiritual discipline is like an adapter. And one of the best explanation actually, that I've, I should have just given, given you this, but explanation for a spiritual discipline is that it's like a magnifying glass that it focuses the sunlight into a singular point. It condenses the sunlight into a single focal point that it burns it. The magnifying glass itself does not burn anything. But it allows the beam of light to be concentrated and focused into a one place. Spiritual discipline is really that. You don't know that you're doing something excessively until you fast from it. Ask yourself, can I fast from a game for a week, for one day? Can I reduce it into half? Can I reduce my purchasing into half? Can I fast from buying shoes or purses or clothes for half of the year or just a month? Can I fast from eating certain things? Can I fast and take away things that I have in my life? Can I really simplify my life today? 
that I'm not satisfying my life with buying things, purchasing things, luxuriating myself. Can I buy, instead of buying a Louis Vuitton purse, can I buy just a regular old purse for a couple of hundred dollars? Can you do that? And can you take that to work? And you're like, no. <laughs> can I actually stop myself from buying a luxurious car with V8 engine and go to work with that? and live my life in a simpler car, in a frugal car. And you realize, no, I can't. You never thought that you were living in excessiveness until you realize that you put these things against spiritual discipline and you think, oh my gosh, I have deviated far from God. Spiritual discipline of fasting, simplicity, and frugality, they expose hidden desires beneath the desires that you have. King Solomon started out marrying one princess for the good of his nation. But underneath that desire, the desire that says, I'm doing this for you, really underneath was his satisfying, it was that he was satisfying his lust and his desire for pleasure. When you look at this, when you find that you have excessive desire to luxuriate yourself, to, to, void, to, to fill the void that you have inside, I want you to remember that God's mercy for you is more excessive. I know the word excessive is not a positive one, but I'm using it in that sense, that God's mercy for you, God's power to transform you is more excessive than your own excessiveness. That we cannot, if a spore is in all of us, and that spore will one day grow, only then through God we realize that only God can help us to live a meaningful, purposeful, holy, godly life. That only God can bring us into holy living. And God's mercy is more excessive, more extravagant and greater than our own sin. The one greater than Solomon is here. One greater than Solomon's wisdom here in form of Jesus Christ that He will guide you through these spiritual disciplines, through His Word, through His Holy Spirit. That when you rely upon Him, and, and, and when you realize that you cannot get rid of your own excessiveness, that's when you turn yourself into prayer and say, Lord, be my excessiveness. Give me wisdom that is greater than my own and greater than Solomon's. Solomon's own desire over time took him far away from God. It took one little misstep. We all make missteps. We all have spores in our spirit. But through Christ, that spore is no more. That he has renewed our mind. That he, his power, his mercy is more excessive than our own excessiveness. Trust in Christ today. I know you were like, what does that mean? But I want you to not trust yourself and, and say, I can do this on my own. But turn to God in a childlikeness and say, I can't do it. I can't get rid of it. But So I surrender my life to you. Help me finish the race. Help me to bear fruit that is gentleness, humility, kindness, love and patience take away my boldness give me a fruit that looks like you and not the fruit that looks like the world